friends of Ride Buddies. It's been a minute, but we're back, and this time with a great episode between two wonderful human beings and friends of us here at Ride With GPS. If you follow us online, you've probably seen Chaz's permanently smiling face. He's one of our ambassadors, an artist, ex-bike messenger, and alley cat racer, and in recent years has become a full-blown adventurer and endurance cyclist. The guy is always on the move and always brings the stoke. For real, he's got a seemingly infinite supply of good vibes and positive energy. His partner in conversation for this episode is Meg Noble. In the long distance mountain biking world, she's a bit of a legend. Official organizer and matriarch of the iconic Stagecoach 400 MTB race, she's also an incredibly talented tattoo artist based in San Diego. Together, they talk about the Stagecoach 400 a ton. So if you're doing the race or just curious, there's a whole lot of good info here. Uh, they also talk about tattoos, they talk about their obsession with their cats, and they generally swap a bunch of great stories about their various cycling endeavors. So saddle up and tune in. You're in for a great ride with these two. So we're here. This is Meg Noble and my name's Chaz. And the last time I saw Meg was in a parking lot drinking a beer in Idlewild, California. And hopefully the next time I see Meg will also be in a parking lot drinking a beer in Idlewild, California, because that's the best way to see your friends, right? True. Yeah, hopefully. I think it will be. Yeah, yeah. March 24th. March 24th. So that is yep. Stagecoach 400, which is a 400 mile mountain bike ultra that starts in Idlewild and ends in Idlewild that Meg organizes. And that's kind of how I met Meg and found out about Meg was honestly doing my first mountain bike ultra race, which was amazing and also terrified for me. Yeah, you did really well. I mean, like seriously, you did fantastic. I remember you said that I think beforehand that it was your first one and I was, I was shocked, but yeah, you did. I mean, I think you were in the top 10, no? I got, I got ninth. I yeah. think you, ten, I like barely scraped in the top 10. And my, my goal was 72 hours and I managed to do it in like 60. So I was like, I was just pumped. Awesome. But I had said, because I'd done a lot of like road ultra racing, and I had said that I would never do mountain bike ultras. Like all my friends were like, do the divide, do that. And I was like, that's ridiculous. I'm never going to do that. I have absolutely no interest in that. And Why not? I, what's that? Why not? Just because I was like, I liked road ultras. Like a mountain, the mountain yeah. biking was like really hard for me to wrap my head around. You know, being yeah. able to like, I'm doing four miles an hour average for yeah. like four hours as I hike yeah. up some mountain and like, I was just, I just, just started doing ultras in the, on the road bike where you're like, you're just, you know, you're clicking along, you're doing like 15, yep. 16, 17 miles an hour average all day. And you're just like going fast and seeing things. And I came from the bike messenger world. So I was like, I'm going fast. Like this is all that matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But no, I, yeah, I hear that. It's, it's so different and there's so much walking and yeah, it's like the slow speeds really kill people, I think, you know, and, and I don't mind it. I mean, but I really had to wrap my head around it because um, like I came from a soccer background. So I used to be really you know limber and really athletic in a hiking type of way but when I stopped playing soccer you know you can't do it forever and right. you know and it, then you get really lopsided because you only ride bikes you like, know like, so, arms, like a t-rex yeah and, and you get exactly <laughs> and then you get like you know short hamstrings and short hip flexors and all this stuff and so then the, the hike a bike I mean that stuff's really hard too in the mountain bike ultras because because your body most people's bodies who do that kind of stuff they just bike a lot my body that's on i mean it is 100 percent the hardest thing for me is the hike of bikes and like yeah. figuring that out i did the atlas mountain right before the pandemic hit and that yeah. was and I, I rode like a gravel bike which was just the absolute choice ever and i rode like carbon sold mountain bike shoes like race shoes oh yeah and it was just like i it was so bad and so that's why stagecoach was a big thing for me because i was like okay mountain bike like shoes i can hike in i had like try i like i guess i trained i would like go hike my bike up in the oakland yeah. hills a little bit which is the most ridiculous thing ever to be like i'm gonna go out for a ride in which i like push my fully loaded bike up hills you yeah. know and my training ride and it's just like the most brutal thing but the, the other day i mean the other day i went um this last weekend i i joined a few friends who did a three-day overnighter you know uh, and i decided that i would come back up oriflam which is our can't big believe set. It <laughs> it's so dumb and so like the stagecoach course a few times did go that direction. They did come up or flam, um, which isn't really the worst part of it anyway. Like one of the worst parts of it is just like how it just takes really, it's harder to get through the desert, but, but yeah. Um, you have to come up that big sand, like outside of Akatuwa's, you have to come up that whole thing. 
yeah yeah and yeah the uh, and but, yeah, the, but of course like you know at part of it was you know maybe there's somewhat of a rite of passage of going up Orifime, right like I'm the new organizer ever all the old timers did it and you know there's, there's so many people who are like well it used to be harder this and that but it there are elements of it that did used to be harder and some of those are going to come back we're going to add some of the rocky single track that's been removed due to some complaints and it's actually going back <laughs> yeah. uh but we um not for this year for next year but uh yeah coming up Orifime, it was like you know, a few friends were like, you can actually ride quite a bit of it. And they're, they're right. Actually, when you're going down it, you're going so fast, or at least I am because I like it, that, that it really does seem like it's really, really steep. And it's not. It, it's pretty steep, but it's more like it's just really rocky. Yeah. So you can ride up it. And, and I'd say, I mean, 90% of it is, to me, definitely rideable, depending on the conditions. But I had like a 50 mile an hour headwind around every corner because it was a storm coming in. And of course, you know, the wind always comes over the mountains and then just dumps down in the desert really fast. And so it was like borderline dangerous. But I was like, you know, I need to come back because I, I literally had to walk the entire thing almost. Yeah. Well, because you come around a, t- a corner and it's like 50 mile an hour headwind about yeah. to blow a bike and you're already on that like climbing like- fully loaded like, on that balance that razor edge of balance where you're like barely holding on and some wind comes and just like yeah yeah exactly it was like yeah and it's one of those things where i think uh in the past i would have thought it was utterly miserable and when i got to the top of sunrise highway it, it really was miserable i mean like i couldn't even i couldn't even ride the single track at the top of mason like back to my car i was just parked at the highway yeah and i i mean i was like crawling on my hands and knees with my bike on the side of the, the single track the, it was yeah. so windy yeah and so so, but, but, you know, after doing more of the, like the mountain bike ultras and just hard bike camping and stuff, I mean, I love it. And, and all the walking is like, I'm like, oh, okay, it's fine. It's part of it. Taking my bike for a walk. I, I am beginning to, I'm just now starting to like come to that realization where like, yeah. when you have to get off, it used to be like a soul crushing thing for me. And I honestly think stagecoach really helped me last year. Cause there was so much of that where yeah. you just, have to, and you, just have, you have to just be okay with it. And you have to just be like, you know, what's the mantra? Constant forward motion. I'm just like, just yeah. keep keep walking. Like, even if you're going two miles an hour, just like keep walking. It's going to be okay. And then eventually you get back on your bike and then it's okay. You know, something that uh, I remember that you posted from last year, because whatever our, you know, I was behind you a certain amount. And I think I, I had reception wherever I was. I was maybe leaving Brago Springs or something. And so, yeah, you know, I went on the, the Instagram. I reposted everybody's stuff and because I just had time and I was on that road flat, you know, I was like, okay, so did it. And, um, and I can't remember when you're finishing. I can't remember when I saw it, but maybe it was when I finished. And you were saying when you arrived and there was just nobody there. And you're like, there's not even a finish line. You're like, well, I did it. <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing. I and, love that about it. I mean, yeah. oh, by the way, someone, everyone should know this. Meg not only organizes the race, but she also races the race. <laughs> just amazing. So when you see all the updated stage coach, that's just her getting service, probably in the arrow bars like reposting as she's on like the flat like section. And then as soon as she gets out of service to go do some gnarly hike a bike, she's like, okay, I'm back to racing and I'll check. <laughs> Not many racers are gonna actually practice what they preach, but Meg is definitely one of them. So that's it. But to your yeah. to your statement, yeah, like I think that's one of the coolest parts about this yeah. type of racing. I come from like, where it's like very prize driven, especially when, mm-hmm. I, when I started as a, as a messenger racing alley cats, like I literally paid the rent by like, racing alley cats on the weekends with the prize money or like selling whatever bag or bike frame I won. And I was like, it was all about getting something and you finish and everyone there and like, ah, you know, and it's like this big thing. But when you finish an ultra, a lot of the times, like, you know, you, I roll, I rolled in at night in Idlewild and, you know, you had taken a photo and you're like, yeah, the book's over here by this hotel. And I like staggered in looking like a zombie, you know, out of the dark, all my lights were dead. I was just like, oh, signed my name and was like, that was amazing. Like I was almost better that there wasn't anybody there. Cause it was like, for me. And I was like, this was just about me doing this thing that I wanted to do. and like having this experience. Yeah. That was, I mean, that was what I got from when you posted it, you know, and, I, and, and, I, and it was nice. It was just nice to hear it because it is this thing that also, you know, you do share, which is great because it's nice to hear people, you know, it's like some people are so um, anti-social media or this and that, especially with the bike races. I mean, there's some of them that don't allow it. And frankly I don't care like who cares right and also it's fun to share I mean you know it's like you don't want to blow up the spot but kind of also it's nice to share this thing that you do with people that you care about and inspire other people to do it so and it's also 2022 (laughs) I think it's like just come out here and do this like especially because you can ride the route so it's like everyone's like what's up with this it looks gnarly it's like yeah take five days 
and do yeah. the route and like enjoy it and you know you don't have to sleep five hours a day and like you know get super gnarly and like you know wear the same jersey for three days and be gross you can like have a really good time <laughs> yeah yeah totally i know some people have been i mean people do it all fall and then a few crazy people do it over the winter time and then pretty much starting in late february people do it all the way up till about may you know people tour it and so and that's kind of how i know usually that i know that the gpx is good and stuff because i'll make it like you know a couple months in advance i'll fix everything for the next year yeah. and then i give it to touring people i'm like okay let me know if anything's weird on there <laughs> well it's crazy like when we did we rode part of it a couple months ago and we came down the willows oh i want to hear really, i want to hear about that that was crazy because like it was honestly so for people that don't know, in, during Stagecoach, there's this section where you're riding from Borrego Springs back up to Idlewild. It's the very end of the race. Like you get done, you get to Borrego Springs, and you're like, I've only got 60 something miles left. I'm almost there. But you, it's all uphill and you're in the desert. When I did it, it was like 95 degrees that year. The last year it was hot. So you're just sweating in the desert, riding uphill in the sand, going like three miles an hour. And then you get to the willows, which is correct me if I'm wrong in describing this, but it's essentially like there's a spring farther up the canyon and it comes like almost like a slot canyon and it, there's no other way up it, but you, it becomes like a stream and you have to walk upstream, but the willows have grown around you. So you're in this tunnel of green, greenness in the desert, which is amazing, but you're also like knee deep in muddy water as you yeah. like drive a loaded bike up through up a stream. It's hard. And, and the, uh... And it's actually, it doesn't grow really around you. Um, Brendan, Rick, and a few other people, let's see, Eric Apple, and uh, there, there were like a hand, let's say like five or six people went out and cleared it from two different directions last yeah. year. So like every year, every couple of years, it gets cleared out. And so it's, the reeds actually just grow straight up through it. And yeah. so when it's not maintained, it's crazy. So when I did it during the race, it was this like very nicely, not, not nicely <laughs> manicured, but it was like a it relatively nice. manicured thing i mean i was at the time i was like this is so gnarly and people were like oh it's been cleared up and i was like yo like, crazy. this is nuts i'm literally riding through a jungle <laughs> in the desert. and so when me and some friends did it the other way we did it in right after thanksgiving it was right after a big rainstorm and it hadn't been cleared and that was gnarly we were like yeah. almost almost impassable at points because there's just so much reeds and so much so much branches and everything and you're on a full other bike and i i love those little those little bar ends of like ergon eight barns which are great yeah. so you're going yeah. Through, yeah you got them too so you're going through something like that and then they're just brutal because they just hook everything like as you're walking through like every two seconds you're like extracting your handlebar from a reed or something like that but it was cool yeah. it was nice though to see it the other way and be like oh i see what it's like when it's actually like really gnarly but the people have a lot of trouble figuring it out and before i had ever done stagecoach i was pretty concerned due to like some friends and other writers who had a hard time figuring it out because if it's really overgrown it can be really hard to find your way in and the trail in the beginning is a little tricky um the way you went so i can't remember how the how i had the gpx but there's like a couple ways to get into it and when you're lost or new or whatever the easiest way is to just get in the water first yep. thing you yep. know you and, and that's i think i write it on the cue sheets because otherwise it's you could spend a you could waste a lot of time and so the first couple of times i did it i just got straight in the water at that really deep point where you have to really <laughs> pick your bike over some big boulders no, i mean really. it's like not so there's another way which I, i'll admit i had only gone for the first time this last time and it's because i was with like six other people and one of them just happened to have done it that way before and so they just they yeah. went straight across and they walked across these rocks for about 30 or 40 feet. I'm like, where are we going? And then they cut back in and just entered the, very gracefully entered the stream. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so then I, I used, I traced my track from last year and I, I made that our track for this year. So hopefully this way people can find that, but it's not intuitive. I guess that, that brings me to an excellent talking point. This is one of those yes or no questions, but that's not really a <laughs> question. What is the gnarliest water you've ever filtered? And then B, are you one of those people that are like, if it goes through the filter, it's good. Or will you like filter and then boil? Goes to the filter, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but I mean, a good filter, right? And then if I'm really not sure about it, I'd filter it and I'd throw some tablets in there. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's what I've done. But, I've boiled yeah. it too a little bit sometimes. Sometimes I'll boil it if I, it's like a night thing and you have the stove out, like filter and then boil yeah. and it's good. I but. never, I never have a stove. Um, I'm like, I don't carry a ton of stuff. I mean, if I'm just like going bike packing, I would maybe carry a stove. I'm like, I always try to just like grab extra food at a store. 
but I mean, obviously you can't do that every time. Um, if it's like remote and it'll be like three days without going to a store, then I would carry a stove on that trip. But I, my bikes are small and five, three, I don't have a lot of carrying space. And so I tend to just, I tend to really skimp on stuff and just be really uncomfortable. That's gnarly. You're like, I have a small bike. So it's going to be way harder than everybody else. I'm like, no, I don't know. But I like, but I like how a bike rides with less stuff on it. And I used to carry more stuff, but it was like, I, I, I finally embraced the backpack, right? Like the backpack. It, it's great. It's such a good thing. It is. it is. And I know that some people don't like it for whatever reason, but if you finally figure out the kind of shirt that you like with yeah. the backpack and, That's and what I found is like, um, yeah, really, really thin, 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 long sleeve. I use like an outdoor research long sleeve hoodie. It's so thin. And when it's cold, I put uh, wool arm warmers under it yep. so that then my arms are warm, but my back is still not too sweaty on it. And man, that's like really saved me space on the bike. It makes the bike more fun to ride because I used to just be too front heavy because I try to have the dropper use a little bit and it's just like impossible. I think that's why I didn't like mountain bike touring, like bike ultra racing for a while because I was loading up so much stuff on the bike that it felt yeah. like I was driving like a Cadillac. And I was like, I'm already not comfortable with a mountain bike. And then this mountain bike is like super heavy. And so you literally hit the nail on the head. Like my plan going into this race season is like back water on the bag all the way off the front, like carry way less stuff and make the bike, like fun, make the bike fun again so that right. I can sit it and like actually enjoy it. Cause like when you're saying you're going down Oriflame, you're like, I was going fast. Like I was not, I was like, Oh my God, oh my God. like creeping down it. Cause the bike was, I had all this weight on the front last year and all this stuff. So my whole race plan for this year is going to be like backpack, like super light bike, like make the bike fast and fun and then suffer. Yeah. And suffer a little more. But Tim Tate and the Utah mixed epic yeah. Meg did this. It was, it was the first one last year, right? It was the, it, inaugural it was the second one. Second one. Um, mm -hmm. it's, talk about it. I mean, I, she inspired me to do it. It's on my race calendar this year and she's talking about muddy Creek and like all this stuff. So like, I really want to hear about this as well. So like, yeah. Up? Oh man. So, you know, I'm like the kind of person that, uh, I can't, I have a really hard time walking away from like a really hard idea. You know, if it seems really hard and fun, I like, I get obsessed, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, how can I do it? How can I do it? And I'm really fortunate in that I have a really flexible schedule. You know, I make my own schedule and, and I can do it, you know, and I'm also self-motivated. Like I don't, I'm sure that I would be a better bike rider if I had a coach or something, but like, I like to ride my bike. So I ride my bike a bunch Yeah. and, um, and I like suffering. I mean, I'm chronically undertrained for the things that I do, but I just really like to do it. So I'm fine. Um, but so yeah, Utah makes Epic the first year, I don't know how many people signed up. It was during COVID. Um, and I watched, I watched the race, you know, from social media and I was like, wow, only I think eight or nine people finished it. And I was like, wow. Okay. I'm like, well, I could, <laughs> I'm like, I could do that. You know? <laughs> and, and so then, so I signed up kind of impulsively for 2021. And when I looked at the sign up list. I was thinking, okay, I recognize a lot of these names and a lot of them are like very strong, fast experienced people. So out of, and I didn't know a bunch of them either. So out of everybody that I did know, I gathered that I was somewhere in the middle. And then if 50% or less people were going to finish, I was going to be at the back. And I was like, well, okay, I, I'm going to be okay with this. I have to be okay with it because I'll be alone probably and probably really like remote and real and alone. And so I was like, alone. okay middle of nowhere. And so, and it happened, you know, in the, about in the four, four days in, I'm watching everybody around me start dropping. Right. And yeah. I'm like, Oh, it's happening. And then the people right in front of me start dropping and I'm like, Oh my God. And, uh, and, but yeah, I was just like, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. I want to finish it. And uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that about doing like ultra races. This is like this, the strategies that you, that you develop sometimes they're not even really based on like racing it's more like uh like like you said like i'm gonna make sure that i, I can't below a certain elevation i'm gonna stay in these hotels and that's like a strategy that's not even centered around like all right like my average speed and like my my racing strategy this is like a survival strategy where you're just like this is what i gotta do to keep my body from breaking because my body's like at that tipping point of breaking and it's yeah. i feel like you get to that point in these races and then you just hold it like right before you're gonna actually do some damage and then like that's the goal the strategy is to hold that fine line Right. Cause <laughs> yeah, because it's like, as, as, as whatever your goals are of finishing any events or any trip or anything, it's like the first goal should just be finishing. Yeah. 100%. You know, finishing and not like dying during it. Right. Like you'd like to do another one also later. <laughs> finishing <laughs> really damaging your mental, your, yeah. your mental health and your body to where you're like, I'm going to do it again. The yep. thing that I'm is cool is how, like, I've been kind of sick on a couple of trips and tours like that, how sometimes you're actually able to like 
while you're pushing your body like 120% and you're probably not recovering at all, you're still somehow able to like get over an illness and like, yeah. you know, keep it going. And it's like, man, the, people always say the human body is an amazing thing. And I like, we do all this crazy stuff, but to me being able to like ride through like bad coughs and things like that, and then like come out and finish and be like, Hey man, four days, four days ago, I almost died, but like, I feel pretty great right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And same, and same with like the, like the saddle sores and bruising and stuff, you know, a lot of people quit uh, the foot thing. I don't know what to say about that. I had no foot issues. I mean, I wear thin wool socks and I take my shoes and socks up and switch. I switch my socks at night. So I don't know. I never had any issues with my feet, but um, a lot of people had issues with you know, like bruising from sitting on the saddle all day. I mean, cause like four days, it hurts at the end of it, you're done. But then like, if you have to keep going, then it's, you hit this really miserable window where it's like two or three days of bad. And, and I don't know. I mean, I guess it, like a lot of hygiene plays into it with the saddle sort of thing, but which I think just comes with experience. You figure out what your body needs to keep going and not Good get question. too bad. Two bibs or one bib? Uh, it depends how long. Utah, I brought two, I brought two liners and the, or I brought, what did I bring? I brought a pair of like the pocketed cargo shorts. Oh, yeah, totally. And then I brought a pair of liners that are pretty thin and mountain bike shorts. And so I was wearing them. I was alternating. That's what I got to do. Cause I've always been a two bib, yeah. but I think that's like road ultra, but like for the, for the mountain bike stuff, the liners, that's like my goal this year is to like check those yeah. out. Those. Cause I got to, yeah. The hygiene thing is real. People that do like one bib, one Jersey for like 13 days or whatever. And it's like, no, no, no. I mean, but if it's like, no, not for that long, I couldn't do it. But, but if you, if you like for stagecoach though, I think I, I think I did one. I think I did one last year, but you got to, you, you know, do you know what a good trick is though? I mean, this is people that don't do this stuff. probably think this is gross. Um, alcohol prep pads. Oh yeah. And just like scrub your pad before it, take I, it off, clean I'll, it and then hang I'll it up. Like, I bring tea trail too. So I bring the pads and then yeah. tea trail. Cause tea trail, if you do any sort of ultra racing, just always have right. tea trail for everything. It's Absolutely. Just, I bring tea tree oil, uh, tea tree oil face wipes, the little, they're mm. like the little circular ones. And yeah. I just put them in with my baby wipes and stuff. And, um, and yeah, you wipe everything with them and it, it that prevents saddle sores. It does. I mean, it really does. Cause most of saddle yeah. sores is just like an irritation that gets mm. to become a thing because it got like mildly infected. Right. So if you can just keep yeah. that infection down, then you're like totally good. Mm -hmm. Also, I love stagecoach because of Agua Caliente. So like halfway through the stagecoach, there's a hot spring with like coin operated showers. And that is like the absolute best thing in the entire world. Maybe a little more than halfway. You definitely got to do the majority of the climbing before you get there, but then you, you do. Yeah. Shower. It's so, it's so, it's so nice. It's, it's so nice. We just camped there recently uh, for one of our local bike shops, Adams Avenue bikes to the camp out. And we got the big group site there and like, there's a whole bunch of people. It was fun though. I mean, we went on a day ride and then came back yeah. and soaked and it was great. It's cool. So that's a place yeah. that I really want to go outside of a racing, outside of a racing, like, you know, environment and actually just go like kick it. Yeah. One day yeah, I'll yeah, do yeah. route as like a, as, as, as a tour and it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Cut off some of like, cut off some of the pavement and like hit some places for longer. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I'm into it. So you said that you set your own schedule, which I also set my own schedule. And to me, that is probably the most important thing in my life is that I set my own schedule and I, yeah. What do you do? Um, <laughs> a lot of, I know stuff, you do lots. I know you do a lot of things. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, I, I do like the influencer bike thing. Like I ran a bike messenger company forever and I like race fixed gear bikes and I raced a lot of stuff. And then when the bike messenger company, when we shut that down, I kind of just found this niche, like doing I mean, I'll just bite the bullet. I hate saying it, but like being, being an Instagram influencer and I just kind of found that. Um, and so I do a lot of that. And that's so like writing and doing that. Um, I actually, we we started a piece of logistics software for running bike messenger companies when we owned our bike messenger company. And so I still run that company um, and we license software to courier companies around the world to like run their courier companies. It's cool because the only thing is it has to be courier owned and operated. So it's like no corporations. It has to be basically like a small, a small business. Um, and we just oh. kind of provide them with a tool that does that. And then I, I do a lot of art. Uh, and I know you also do a lot of art and that's kind of something I wanted to touch on, but you're a tattooer, right? I am. Yeah. Yeah. I've been tattooing for, uh, I started my apprenticeship sometime in 2005. So yeah, it's been a little, been a little while. That's yeah. Amazing. And I work. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I work at uh, I work at Outdoor Traditions Tattoo, which um, actually I just left. I was at Buju Tattoo for ten years in San Diego. Um, I worked with good friends there, and I just 
uh, in the last year, started working outdoor traditions for my friend Angel and Angel Lopez, and he is a stagecoach mountain biker kind of guy. And uh, but yeah, we start, we basically rode mountain bikes all through all through COVID. And his ideas that he has with how he runs his tattoo shop is, I mean, it's it's what I always wanted, but I didn't have really the time with everything else that I do to create. And he created it. I was like, wow, it's here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so basically we have a shop that's uh, focused around, um, you know, like giving back to the outdoors community. And so he was a big rock climber, uh, still is, but definitely has got the mountain biking bug. And so we do fundraisers, you know, for mountain bike associations, sends money into different climbing associations, outdoor associations. And, um, and we're doing some, um, we're getting like a, we have, we had sort of a situation in our shop. Somebody drove a car into our shop in November. Oh, they straight into the front, right? Like- yeah, destroyed it. And so they're actually going to demolish that building. We just found out, but we have a new space. And so we're just about set up. We're like just about ready to make the announcement and show all the pictures and stuff, but it's, it's okay. red. And so it's about a block from Belboa Park. And uh, so we're going to have like a shop mountain bike ride out of there at the Florida Canyon trails. And um, yeah, it's awesome. It's like the best place to work for what I do in life that's i mean i had no idea that the that angel because i i know about angel lopez from from instagram just following tattooers i didn't know that he was a stage coacher too that's like yeah he yeah he did he did the first day of it last year and and unfortunately he got like an injury in his his eye and his knee also but he had like a he got a big cut in his eye so so he stopped but yeah we've he and i have done like overnighters out in the desert and we ride all over san diego that's so right isn't there a stage coach wasn't there a stage coach tattoo didn't I see you? So you there was, some- yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's cool. I mean, I'm like, do I have a patch somewhere? I used to have a patch sitting around of it. Yeah, it's like a, it's from a patch that I made, and it's just you know, it's the desert, the mountains, and the ocean. And I mean, like, what I was doing like a deal for finishers, like you know, uh, I think I forget what it was, like our shop minimum or whatever, you know, hundred bucks. And so yeah, that's cool. If you want I, one, come get it. I, I do, <laughs> I know, but it has to be for this year. So from the messenger community, like so many tattoos from alley cats i would say so many of my tattoos were tattoos that i got during racing like street races so i always thought yeah. i would love that about that that specific community and so like finding out that that's also part of like the mountain bike culture community i'm like i'm definitely going to get mountain bike culture tattoos yeah and you know like i it's it's funny i used to always donate tattoo gift certificates to alley cats and so cuz like i also you know I didn't, I didn't necessarily get into bikes or fix your bikes, but fix your bike. I mean, it was a huge part of getting into it as like a young adult, you know? And um, yeah. And it was like the best thing to do when you're talking about selling bags that you won and stuff. And I was like, like, you've been there, you've been, you've been at Alley Cat Prize and been like, I don't need another chrome sling bag. I don't need another bag. Another chrome (laughs) bag. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. That was honestly like, and it's in, in San Diego, I met all I mean, almost all my friends through the velodrome. I used to just race there casually, like recreationally at the velodrome. And I met so many people through that. And that, I mean, that it's, I mean, I don't know, it's like morphed, you know, in all these different ways, but it's like, I feel like I've gotten to meet people through all the different facets of the bike community here. So I mean, I love it. Really, what's rad is it, you know, it sounds really cliche, but riding bikes does connect people. And I would say that 90% of my really good friends in, in every in my own entire life come from some some facet of some bike community that I was a part of at some point or still yeah am. so yeah yeah exactly I want to see more races like the transcontinental style like the alley cat style in my mind where they just give you the checkpoints because I think that's the yeah. only thing I think is lacking in like the American race scene for ultras is that they're all like kind of set route races and I would love to see one in America, especially a mountain bike one, which would be like really gnarly where they're like, here's some checkpoints, good luck. And you're just kind of like off into the wind. I mean, I, so I'm kind of working on uh, on a local one that I was going to do. I mean, you know, similar, like I was just, I was just using different phrasing for it, but yeah, like sort of like a scavenger hunt kind of thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, ha- I don't have a particular route in mind, but I have some trails that I really want people to have to ride on or they would have to really, yeah. really go around. I want you to hit this. I'm going to yeah. kind of make it, make it so you're going to have to ride this thing. Exactly. Or you're going to have to do some really like undesirable thing to get around it. And yeah. so, um, yeah, we, I mean, it was, it was going to be starting at the old shop, uh, but then, so now I guess we'll start at the new shop, but yeah, I don't know. We'll see how that plays out. I've got, I have some ideas in mind, I'm, but I, yeah, I really like that. I love that type of stuff. You know, I just did the last LA tourist race that happened, which is kind of, it's basically the same thing where they're just like, here's some routes up in the, in, in the crest, like, go do it. We picked a horrible route. It was speaking of, we hiked 
we hiked up a mountain for like four hours. It was so bad. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. It was, it was like, that's the thing. It's an adventure. You go out to have an adventure and we had one. How long, how long is the LA tourist race? It's different <laughs> ones, right? <laughs> it took us like nine hours. I think it took the winners yeah. like seven. <laughs> Cause yeah. it really is like choose your own adventure. And like, we chose a, we chose like the hardest adventure possible. I think the guy, the guy that won it was like seven hours and like 20 minutes. And I think our, we were out for like almost like nine and a half or something. So <laughs> oh, it's a long time. It was good training. Yeah. My, my buddy Alvin, yeah. who he raised stagecoach and we, we know each other from like the, like fixed your criterium scene and stagecoach was his first mountain bike ultra, but we were doing it together and we were literally like, this is just training. This is just training yeah. as we, were like, you know, pushed our bike up mountains. We were like, we're just training right now. This is all good. It's all, it's all there. We're going to do it. Yeah, so. it's true. It's funny, right? I mean, like, I know we're hopping all over the place. We're probably both have pretty bad ADHD. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, the Utah makes epic. I mean, the route changes every year, but I think you can have so much fun. I was thinking about one of those days that I think I only did 35 miles a day. And it's because I think I hiked like the first 14 miles of it or something. I mean, we like hiked over a mountain range. And yeah. I remember my partner, Peter, I got reception at some point and he messaged me and he's like, Hey, just making sure you're okay. Your tracker hasn't moved very far and it's 3 PM. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I appreciate it. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like walking and, and I, and I looked and I had only gone 17 miles and it was 3 PM and I probably, I probably started riding at six. Yeah. The sun came up. You, you were know? like, time to get out of the bag and get moving. Oh Isn't man. Funny though with yeah. the though because like so for people that don't know ultra races of almost any sort there's a it's called dot track leaders is the website right yeah there's a couple different ones but yeah we use track leaders for stagecoach yeah so you there's a websites where everyone who's racing carries like a gps tracker um and then that's how the race is like that's how you watch one of these races is you watch all the little dots move and so people that know you like your partners or your parents my mom actually called me before watching and if you're having a hard time or you miss route the people will be like, what are you doing? Like, what are you, are you okay? Are you still breathing? Or like, you're on, you're taking the wrong way. And like nine times out of 10 in that scenario, you already know that like everything is totally screwed and you're like struggling. And then someone's like, what are you doing? And you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know? <laughs> I know you're like beside yourself with exhaustion and there's probably like 10 things going wrong. And then, yeah. And your mom texts you. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, you're going the wrong way. You're going away from everybody else. And you're like, ah, I know. Yeah. The best the was when week. people would text me during Utah McStepic and they're like, there's nobody behind you. <laughs> like, I don't need to hear that. Like, that's not a motivating factor. <laughs> I'm like, I know. Or, or they'd be like, you're really far ahead of those other two guys. I'm like, yeah, they started like four days after me. <laughs> they're doing ITTs. <laughs> but yeah, it was fun. I think you'll love it. I'm excited to, I'm still honestly, I keep getting tempted to sign up for it, but I really want to do AZT. And it's only a few weeks after Utah McStepic this fall. And I, and I mean, I'll tell you what, like my legs are trash for like six weeks. Oh yeah. Guaranteed. So, the recovery from races like that is like not even your legs, but just like everything needs like some time to just, you know, settle and relax. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited about to, to hike a bike AZT. Yeah. I, I, I'm excited to do some new stuff. Um, after stagecoach, I signed up for pinions and pines. Did oh, you? That. No, no, I, I didn't, but I've heard about that. As people I saw have, some like really good yeah it looks fun as a few people were describing it they're like it's like stagecoach without some pavement you know because it's about the same ratio and it's a more single track and i, I don't know i'm excited about it it'll be fun yeah i'm, I'm pumped on i'm doing <laughs> the, new, the new collo race um yeah it's like this is the first year and it's uh you know i all i remember from when they it's like a thousand miles from Col in colorado new mexico and they were like a thousand miles 13 resupplies and four hot springs on the route. And I was like, I'm so down. That's like a perfect ratio. Like one resupply a day, one hot spring every two days, roughly. And I was like, that's all I need to know. Like that's, it's going to be a great time. So that's awesome. Yeah. But, and you, you know, you could talk to uh, Casey, the, the creator of that is doing stage coach this year. Oh really? No, I had no idea. <laughs> that's right. It will definitely connect. Cause I, I mean, I, I have a lot of questions. I kind of like that. It's like a first time race. Cause like nobody really knows, you know, Casey's out on their moto a ton. And so I see like the recons always on like motos and it looks amazing. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, I want to go do that. But then it's like, you know, it's one thing to go recon all the trails and ride them, but then to string it together as a race, it's like the, 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 the knowledge to sit and take a minute, I think is what really separates a lot of like the good racers from the great racers. Cause you can, or even the ones that don't get to finish. Cause if you're at least for me, like I'm in those scenarios, I get like really 
kind of like, oh my God, oh my God. And then I'll do something stupid. I'll break something or I'll like hurt myself. Whereas if you just take like 30 seconds and you're just like, okay, it's okay. Like take a deep breath, sit down, maybe eat some food. Cause you're probably hungry. You know? Yeah, no, totally. You know? You're definitely hungry. <laughs> you're definitely hungry. Yeah. So like have a couple of bites of snack, drink some water and like think through it. And then like 30 seconds later, you're like, okay, this is okay. I can do this. I'm going to take my seat bag off and like throw it up or like, you know, take, do whatever you got to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Taking that time. Yeah. It's really important. A feet thing too. It's like, sometimes you just got to take your shoes off. Like, I mean, uh, uh, one time I was uh, at a race and it was at, at higher elevation, not crazy, maybe 7,000, 6,000. And I live at sea level and, um, and my feet got really swollen on the first day. And it was only maybe 12 or not 12, maybe 10 hours into it, but my feet were so swollen. And I was like, and, and they're just hurting and, you know, they're crushing this every, I felt every seam in my sock, you know? And so, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to stop. And I sat down on the side of the road and I took my shoes and socks off and I just let my feet, I like suck them on top of my bike. And I was like, okay, I'm just going <laughs> like, to wow. And I, I did, I sat there for five minutes and I had a snack and, and then I put my other socks on just to change the way of what, whatever was going on. And I was fine, yep. but I was miserable for an hour before that. Just yeah, stubbornly I mean, pushing through it. Yeah, because you're like, I got it. Can't like, constant forward motion. I can't stop. Like that's that's the mantra. Yeah. But also, you have to know when to like pause for like five minutes and like take care of something. And, yeah, like, exactly. You need different socks too. I brought two pairs of really thick wool socks, and that was the issue. Like I think you were right with like having like a thin, like a, an alternative type of sock, like a thinner sock and a thicker sock. Huge, huge game changer. Yeah, and I think too. I mean, like I, I am for sure not the person to talk about cold weather riding because I just don't do it that much, and I don't, you know, that's something I really. If I wanted to do something cold, I would really need to talk to somebody experienced about it. But I feel like the, you know, you, you wear whatever your sock situation is that work. For for me, it's thin wool socks, and I think that wearing things over your shoe is really important. So I mean, having, I think that's where you got to go with it next step. Yeah, I think, I, I think you're absolutely yeah. right because I brought like thick wool socks. So like, it's going to be freezing cold in Utah and it was super cold. But once you start riding my feet, I, I guess I have hot feet because my feet were like instantly hot and sweaty. And then I was just yes. like, like swamp feet. Yeah, and they were all swollen. I'm a sea level dweller too. So we were up at like 6,000 feet. My body was like, what are you doing? And I, that was actually the only bummer of that whole trip is that I didn't bring thin socks I just had like two pairs of like I had like the thick socks and then the thicker socks that I was sleeping in so I was like even if I had swapped over I would have been swapping over into some like it was crazy they were huge they took up almost all of my seat bag <laughs> it was like my they were like my slippers what kind of what bag did you what kind of degree bag did you carry I brought a 15 degree bag and I blew it I should have brought a zero degree bag it was oh fun. yeah and I'm I do the I'm a recent convert to the down pants and the down jacket and even then I was wearing that in the bag and I was still waking up at like 5.30. You know what it's like, 5.30, the sun's not up yet, but you're laying there and Freezing. you're just like, yeah, the sun's cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, oh my God. I hate I would, being cold at night. I'm always cold. And, yeah. but like, so like, that's a real question. When you're freezing cold and it's like 5.30, do you get up and start riding or do you just lay there until the sun comes up and be cold? Oh man, it depends. I think it depends on, it depends on how, quick you would need to get going but sometimes that god I don't know I think for me it's a really really tough one like there have been times when it's been wet and cold and I've stayed in because I just can't get up because if I get out I'm also wet and then exposed you know but then yeah I don't know I know some races are like you just get up and start riding and it's like it's true like you will be warm like 30 minutes in but that like from the time you get up to when like 30 minutes later when you're hot is just like pure misery. Yeah. And you know what I do when it is really cold and um, I, 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 I do put on a lot of, I, I don't put my pad on, but I do wear, so, sometimes I'll just get up and I'll have enough clothes on that I can shove everything on my bike really quick. And I'll start, I'll just ride in my pajamas for like an hour until they warm up. And then I change clothes. That helps a lot. Yeah. I'm actually really interested to see how that works with racing. Cause I started doing that with the down pant and down jacket. I've actually mm-hmm. not, I've done not a sleeping bag. Like last time when I did stagecoach, I didn't bring a bag. I just brought that and a bivy and a pad, which is kind of weird. Like getting used to sleeping in a bivy is tough and I really like it now, but then not having a sleeping bag, even though I was exhausted, I felt like strangely exposed because I was essentially just laying in my bivy. And it, but once I fell asleep, I was fine. But then when I woke up, it was cold, but I was like, I'm ready. Like I'm already warm. I'm wearing my sleeping bag. And I just got back on the bike and like started riding immediately. Yeah, so. it is. It's like really, it's nice and really fast. Like even when we were just camping this weekend, it was so cold that, well, it wasn't so cold, but it was it really wasn't that cold. It was cold. Part of it was that it was a wind advisory. So it was so yeah. windy, made it extra cold. We couldn't make coffee or anything. And so my friends 
uh, I'm the latest riser of everybody. You know, I have the latest job and everybody, everybody else just wakes up so much earlier than I do. I'm a morning person, but it's just my job's late. You know, it's like, you, you wake up when you want, you wake up when your body yeah. tells you. Yeah, Which exactly. I, I wake up after eight and a half hours. And so, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, I mean, it was six 30, 6 40. And they're like, we're just going to roll down the hill and make coffee down there. And I'm like, okay I, i'll like, meet you down there <laughs> well, <I'm not> ready yet. <laughs> yeah and so um but it was it is it's easy when you have a bivy and not a lot of stuff because you just grab everything and just and especially when you've done it you know enough times you just shove everything on the bike real quick and roll it's kind of nice it is i'm terrified yeah. that this i broke i broke the tendon in my finger packing oh, a yeah. bag in my living room of course so now every time I, I do the like wake up quick pack in the morning i'm like i'm so scared of like breaking oh, that's the funny Cause it was just like was packing a sleeping bag into a bar bag. And it was like the stupidest thing. I, I, need, to I need to bring like a, like a brace. So that I'm doing it when I'm racing, I can just like stuff with wild. Dude, the other day I was, I was working on my bike and I was just, you know, I have a small house in California, you know, and, and all my bikes, I have like three bikes in the living room and two bikes in the bedroom and six bikes in the back room. And, and so, but I was moving something and I caught my, I caught my knuckle in between the crank arm and the, um, the stay. Yeah. Oh my God. I like, wrenched it but it's always something stupid like that and it's like yeah i don't know it's always it something it like doesn't that. happen when we're actually out in these crazy gnarly situations like it sucks when it happens at home because you're like dummy like i'm at home but i was like i i had that same thought where i was like i'm, I'm so glad that this didn't happen somewhere gnarly. you know i did so i so I, I did write down like some things that i wanted to talk about but i was more just curious now that we're, we're talking about this um do, how do you feel riding overnight by yourself does it ever scare you like to be on the trail yeah totally although honestly i'm way more afraid of being around humans at night than i am when i'm way out there like so For i sure, started same. On the road ultras and like through europe and like you're riding through like albania at like two o'clock in the morning and that's like okay this is scary or even like you know i i for me if i'm out especially like in the desert i love riding in the desert because in my head i'm like i know there's nothing that big like there's not enough food out here to sustain large predators. So there's nothing that's going to yeah. get me. So like, I, I, I do like, I, I still, I mean, I'm still, I still get scared of the dark. Like I 100%, if I think about it too much, I will be like, what's behind that bush? Like, what's that shadow? Yeah. And you know, especially if you're, you know, on running on three or four hours of sleep after a couple of days, those shadows really start looking real. You know? They <laughs> really do. I know. And, and yeah, that happened, happened so much when last time when I was in Utah and I mean, there just be so many eyes and everybody ahead of me kept reporting back seeing mountain lions. I think there were six mountain lion sightings. And so it was like, and, and I saw one, but it was, I saw one in like a really nice way where it was like on a side of a cliff and there was a big, you know, ditch that it would take quite a bit of effort to get to me and it didn't want to get to me. And it was like really majestically standing on a cliff face. I was like, this is incredible. It's like the Lion King. And, uh, but everybody else's were on the trail where they were literally almost running into them or they were turning around and they were being followed or, you know, Tim Tate oh. got, Tim yeah. Tate got surrounded by three. I don't know if he, I, I think so he shared that story. Cause I've never actually had that happen. I've had coyotes mess with me. I've had like plenty of raccoons, you know, I like, try to get to my snacks, but like, I've never really seen large animals when I'm out doing that. So like, I think that's the Utah mix epic. That's going to be like a thing for me, <laughs> but I'm also just very much one of those people that's like, it's not there. Like, la, 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 la. You yeah. Know? Yeah. 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 I mean, that's I yeah, I, the best strategy. I feel like you guys, I feel like I'm going to need to be a little more like, okay, like acknowledge this think critically about what to do to keep like everything safe and everything good. Cause I think in some scenarios I shouldn't just be like, I'm just going to put my baby tighter and like hope that this, you know, garbage bag saves me. <laughs> you know, I think, I mean, but it's, I, I do think that generally like when you're, I mean, you don't hear very many stories. I mean, maybe, you know, you hear some scary grizzly bear stories and stuff like that, but you don't really hear a lot of stories of people being attacked, like in their baby. I feel like it's like a lot of it is the chase factor. Right. So they like to come after you. Yeah, when you're moving, yeah. they're like, okay. I mean, if, if I ever heard a story of someone getting attacked in their baby, I would fucking... <laughs> yeah, I know, same. I know. So I kept telling myself, like, I would, because when I would get in my baby, I'd be like, okay, and I would zip that sleeping bag over my head and just be like, done. I feel like you have to. Like, I mean, I, I'm the yeah. same way. Like, I definitely, I, I sleep really well outside most of the time. I like, you know, you, you, I feel like at a certain point, if you do this enough, you have to kind of train yourself to go to sleep. Because if you're yeah. like nervous and you're just laying there, you're not going to be able to do like multi-day races if you just don't sleep. But I'm definitely the same where I'm just like, all right, I'm here. Like, zip, <laughs> and this is it. Yeah. It, takes, it takes me. 
Yeah. And that's, yeah. And same with like being way out in the back country where there aren't very many people. And especially, I mean, the desert, I agree with you. I feel the same way. I feel very safe in the desert, which who knows if that I, I do think it is a little safer. Um, definitely more worried about people for sure. And yeah, it, it's still, I don't know. I still, I feel the more I've ridden overnight by myself, the easier it's gotten, but there's definitely, it did make me feel better at the end of, uh, Utah mixed up. Like everybody was DMing each other and sharing stories and, and, and everybody was worried about the mountain lions and stuff and everybody was singing to them and yelling and everybody was having all the same moments, you know, uh, it made me feel a little bit less like a movie. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, that's what you do, right? You just, you got to make a lot of noise and you're out there like singing whatever Mariah Carey song pops in your yeah. head at like, three o'clock in the morning and be like, please don't come <laughs> <and help me." laughs> Yeah, I mean, no, exactly. I, mean I, I think I've had someone, honestly, I think it's, it's funny. I always tell people this, but the best night's sleep I've ever gotten during an ultra race was uh, during Stagecoast last year. Um, I, I got a burrito at that spot um, well before, you know, when you, the last spot, when you climb up, I forget yep. what it's called. Got one, stashed it, did the whole climb. I descended aura flame at night. It was like mildly terrifying. I was definitely not sending it like you were. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, and then I got down to the desert. It was super windy. Same as you. Like sometimes you come around a turn and you, you just get blasted. And at my head, I was just like, it's going to be a headwind. I'm so screwed. But I got down to the desert. It was a tailwind. It was warm all the way to the springs, had my quarters ready, got a shower, ate my burrito, and then just like walked out, you know, like a hundred yards away from the humanity and just laid in the dirt and slept. And I just remember like my alarm went off and I just, I felt, I got the best night of sleep I think I've ever had by camping in the desert. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, it was. I slept, you know, oh man, I I think the best night of sleep I've ever gotten was also during a stagecoach but it was a couple of years ago and it was the rainy cold year and my partner peter and i had we actually had to cut some of the single track off that year because it was, it was like a monsoon the day that we took off and so we had to cut out a bunch of single tracks in that runa and um so sweetwater we didn't do sweetwater but we came we got there like on the pavement and we went off route just a little bit to actually go back and we slept next to the steel bridge oh yes yeah, and we had and we had gotten we had gone to a corner store on the way there for like our last bit of snacks and um we got the the cut water margaritas and it was yeah. right they're so good and it was right when they first started making them i think and we were kind of like oh it's like a margarita in a can okay this is great you know and so we just threw them in our bags and when we got there i'm drinking i'm like man this is good it's like salty and you know strong but then also i i'm trying to go to bed right away so we basically just chugged them i mean i passed out. Those are like four shots. They're like they it, it so is. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea, and so, but yeah, I remember we were wet. I think it was raining on us. We didn't bring bivvies that year. Even we just brought the like um, emergency blanket things. Yeah. We made bad decisions. I mean, it was like, yeah. and so yeah. But I remember I was like, I woke up the next morning and I was like, I feel great. Like I slept, I mean, I, we probably slept six or seven hours just because of the rain, and, you know, everything. So yeah. it was awesome. I love it. Though. Like when you like the, like the worst planning and the, like you make a bunch of bad choices, but somehow it's like, this is amazing. Like yep. everything's going great right now. It's so good. Yeah. It's yeah. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> oh, I can't wait for stagecoach this year. Um, instead of doing the rapid fire questions at the end of this, um, yeah. I want to do, I just, what's your go-to gas station snack first thing you're gonna grab oh those uh those breakfast sandwiches you know the ones that have like the sausage egg and cheese on the biscuit that you microwave microwave? that's the jam yeah that's it what about your go-to drink if you're gonna get that and a drink oh probably mexican coke okay very solid very solid yeah that was that was oh yeah the other one is if it's one two three go or one two three do you go on go or do you go on three? I think I go on three. Oh, okay. I don't know. Like ready, set, go. Yeah. But like people are like one, two, three, go. Or like, do you go on yeah. go? I mean, no, if you go, I go on three. <laughs> I go on go personally. I mean, everyone's different, but like, it's definitely, I realize there's a huge divide between people who are like, I go on three or I go on go. It's like, huh. Yeah. Right. Okay. Are we doing, are we doing rapid questions? Yeah, yeah. I mean, ask me some questions. Okay, like okay, pre pre ride breakfast, sweet or savory? Sweet. Sweet. Oh yeah. yeah. As much as I hate it, probably oatmeal, just because it's like so basic. Oh. Or donuts. I'm a donut fiend. Ooh, I love donuts. Yeah, you know, one of the best foods I ate at Utah was a uh, apple fritter that was like a day old and it had been in my seat bag and it had just turned into this solid like 
fat, sweet thing. That's so you, good. You, you aged it. You finally mm-hmm. aged it fitter in your seat bag yep. to like see perfection. <laughs> it was so good. All right, I have another one. Have you ever uh, taken your cats camping? No, and I really want to. <laughs> don't, I, I'm not ever going to judge anyone that puts their cat on a leash, but I don't want to ever put my cat on a leash. <laughs> but I really, so me and my partner, we do a lot of desert camping. I've got like an old Toyota pickup and I want nothing more. We've got a big fat little male cat named Little Man and he's like so chill. And I want nothing more than to just have him in the bed of the truck with us. It's so good. Oh, I want is, to see is little is, is little man is little man like a like an like an explorer runner or is he super chill and just wants to hang out with you? Chiller. He's a chiller. He does not want to go anything. So that's why I think it'll work. So we actually have talked yep. about it a ton. We never pull the trigger because like I obviously am so terrified of losing him that I'm like like if I lost yeah. him I'm losing my son so I don't know what I would do. So like it's real. Know. I've taken I've taken my cat Izzy. I wish she was around but um she uh I've taken her camping a bunch. And she's amazing. And it's because, yeah, it's because she doesn't want to run. She just wants to hang out. And so it's, but it was, I was laughing. You said that you don't put a cat on a leash. I just posted a picture of her on a leash from last fall. Uh, but she doesn't, it's more so that I can, so I can see her because she's black. And yeah. so I put this like neon pink leash on her and I just let it trail behind her so that I can just see where she is. I yeah. don't want to bring their cats. And so it's, I think it's something that will happen, but we, me and my, me and my partner are very much still like, we're just so terrified of losing little man. We have another cat yeah. She could never go camping. She's like way too high strung. She would just, she would just hate it. But I think yeah. like, like when you're driving and he's just sitting on your lap for it's like so good. a road trip, like that seems like the best thing in the world to me. It's so nice. And like, and Izzy will like get in my sleeping bag and she's <gasps> good in the tent. Like she's so good. It's yeah. really, really fun. Like you're already covered in cat hair in your normal life. And then you just bring it out camping. So you're covered yeah. in cat hair in nature. It's too. so good. And like for her, she's like not very, she, she's not very adventurous, but she just, she likes looking at new scenery. So she's like, yeah. oh, this is cool. And she'll walk around a camping area and then she'll go get back in the car and just sit there and just watch us make food or something. It's she's awesome. like, well, I'm done looking. This was interesting. Yeah. But like, yeah. yeah. She's so good. We actually can leave all the doors of the car open and, you know, that's, yeah. That's a goal I have. Like, yeah, I definitely want to get to that point where like the cat can just come and like chill and like be with us, but not yeah. terrified or anything. All right. right. That, that makes me feel better to hear you say that it's like a thing. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think it's weird. I mean, it's just if you have the right like personality of the cat. Um, let's see. What else? I got one for you. Uh, yeah. What is it? Peanut M&Ms or peanut butter M&Ms? Oh, peanut M&Ms. Peanut, thank you. Oh, I have one for you. Uh, oh. Both, pair, both socks on, both shoes on, or one sock, one shoe, one sock, one shoe? Both socks, then shoes. But not it's not always the greatest, especially when you're out, because then if you have to get up midway, you've got one sock and one shoe, and then you end up walking around with a dirty sock. So it's true. I didn't think about but that. It's, but it's definitely the way that I do it. <laughs> That's true. Huh. What else do I have? Oh, have, you ever, have you ever been in a bathroom? <laughs> yeah yeah at uh utah makes epic the last my last night i got uh some really really good sleep in a campground bathroom there was a there was a, a rain a windstorm rainstorm outside and it was like sideways rain and i was about to enter a flood zone so i couldn't really go any further and yeah. so i was like fuck it staying in this bathroom and it was so clean it was the bathroom at a day use area next to a campground it was outside moab uh okay. on the river and it was just really clean. It, it seemed like it had been like pumped, bleached, and then nobody had used it for a week. Sick. It was perfect. Yeah. And so um, I laid everything out there and the wind was howling outside and I just slept for like eight hours. Sounds, I've seen, I haven't done yeah. it. And I, every time I go to a bathroom at a campsite, I'm always like, yeah, man, yeah, okay. This is where I always think about it, but I haven't had to do it yet. And I imagine that I just haven't done enough mountain bike ultras yet. So once, as you do more of these, I feel like it would it's going to become like a thing. Okay.